welcome to a special Patreon episode of the Epoch of Incredulity. And that's a great idea. We should introduce ourselves. This week, this week, this episode, we're going to be talking about acid commun- eh. We're going to be talking about acid communism and psychedelic consciousness. Uh, I'm hell yes, indeed. I'm Scott. I'm going to partially be leading this conversation, but also we have. I'm Ellie. Actually, no, I'm not Ellie. I'm just <laughs> sorry. I'm staring oh, at boy. my username. <laughs> I'm staring at my username. And uh, yeah, no, I'm actually Kava. Uh, For listeners who aren't familiar, um, I have a dissociative disorder. I am a multiple. I have two parts. Uh, Ellie is usually on the epoch, but sometimes I show up and do stuff as well. Um, We are fully co-conscious. We share memories. So basically, we're just one person, but we're also not. It's very weird. We have a whole episode where uh, Ellie talks about me on our Patreon, um, which you can listen to if you subscribe to our Patreon, and hopefully soon, uh, regardless of whether you're subscribed, um, that's, what is it, patreon.com slash epic incredulity, is that right? Hell yes, you got that correct. Right. Very good yeah. sales. And actually, pitch. do you, can I, uh, can I tell a brief uh, related anecdote which you can also cut out later if you want. <laughs> sure. That means I'm not going to um, cut it out. All right, well. Recently, I've actually come to terms with the fact that I used to have a third part, which was a sort of frozen three-year-old version of myself um, who only really came out and fronted once. It's very weird. Um, this is actually pretty typical for people who are multiples, They often will have what's called littles, which are alters that are versions of themselves from whenever, however old they were when traumatic things happened to them in childhood. Um, I have already integrated that part with my therapist. We did EMDR, which is eye sensitive. No, wait. Uh, Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. So she's not around anymore. Um, Most of our uh, meeting last night was actually about that type of therapy. Oh, damn. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Anyway, all of that has helped me to realize and helped Ellie to realize that I am what's called the protector part. I was created to protect that three-year-old version of myself. Um, and yeah, tweet at us if you want to learn more about dissociative disorders, etc. I, I will answer your question. Anyway, Hi. Will, who are you? You are Will. Talk about yourself. <laughs> yep, hey. we got the peanut gallery here. I uh, know, we're all here. Uh, hi, my name's Will. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else for introductions you got. Why do you need <laughs> fucking DSA meeting, dude. dude I don't know. <laughs> you want me, to, you want me to do that again? I just, I'm, I'm used to it. No, you're fine. You were introduced. That's it. Joe. <laughs> all right. Reading. Re- reading? Reading. Mm. Joe's right. reading right now. He's a little bit too, uh, <laughs> he's distracted. That's fine. Reading again. The notes. He can't talk about who he is because he's reading. So that's Joe over there. <laughs> I'm like on the verge of like telling people your Twitter username. <laughs> Yet again, yeah. Like you'll find out that Joe's Twitter handle by the end of the episode, but not from Joe. Right. I can promise you that. <laughs> if you've last three episodes of our show have taught us anything. All right. Uh, so. I guess we could begin with the definition of psychedelia. The term psychedelia is derived from the ancient Greek word for psyche, which means soul. And I'm uh, I'm not super great. Like, I, you know, I took Latin, but I'm not super great. Uh, Delaun, I say, I want to see. Is how you pronounce that? Uh, Which means to make visible, to reveal. reveal. Basically translating to, like, mind Mind manifesting. manifesting. And it was a term... Devised between uh, Humphrey, uh, who is typing? Uh, between Humphrey Osmond and Aldous Hus- Huxley, and basically, to my mind, uh, they were trading terms around, and they came up with the term psychedelia to describe the experience of LSD. And to my mind, a- a psychedelia—it's not necessarily tied to drugs, and we'll get into this later. But it's more—it's uh, to me the real definition and. You know, if someone's serious about psychedelia, the definition is about it's about 
taking reality and questioning the limits of it and questioning where it ends and how we can shape it and how we can connect to it and how we can move beyond our reality to create something better. And not just reality outside of ourselves, but, you know, soul revealing, mind revealing it, uh, psychedelics also reveal you to yourself. And I think that's an equally uh, important part of the whole thing. Sorry to interrupt. You didn't interrupt. That was perfect. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, these ideas, like when we talk about acid communism, when we talk about psychedelic consciousness, a lot of these ideas ha- were developed by Mark Fisher. And that's, Ellie, do you want to, or excuse me, Hava, do you want to take that? Do you want to? Uh, sure. Um, so Mark Fisher has this idea of acid communism, and it sounds like like he used the word communism, used the term not really to specifically evoke any previous ideas of communist theory that already exist. I think he it sounded like he just kind of tacked that on there to indicate like the idea of something beyond capitalism, which I guess necessarily would probably be communistic in a classical sense, but uh not positive and yeah so he built this idea on some previous i think these actually were books that he wrote correct me if i'm wrong um one of the ideas or books that he built acid communism on was called hauntology Hauntology. which basically is uh what he calls an almost pathological inability to imagine new futures and you know if you look around it's pretty obvious that we, at least as a culture in this country, have this problem <laughs> very badly. Um, Scott, I know you watch a lot of movies all the time, and you may it's have a crippling probably, addiction. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure you're as aware as I am that the Hollywood and the movie industry, at least in this country, seem to be addicted right now and for the past several I don't even know how long, um, to make in remakes of stuff and reboots of stuff. And really just like, we're all just like ODing on nostalgia. And this is like, you know, it's pretty understandable. I feel like they've been ODing on nostalgia basically my entire life. Oh, yeah. So what yeah, year that... were you born, though? 96. We were doxing the right. hell out of this kid. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. I think that's, you know, around when it started, maybe. Um, And anyway, like, you know, so things that are familiar to us are comforting. So it's not a surprise. And, like, it's undeniable that reality, whether or not you watch the news or whoever you are, the reality of life in the U.S. and in the world has been, it's been becoming more and more disturbing because, hey, we live in late capitalism woohoo and also like climate change which is directly related to late capitalism and so it's really not that surprising that we would want to just be ODing on things that are familiar to us um and not able to imagine even imagine like how we could possibly have a future where we don't need to do that and scott you mentioned forrest gump do you have things to say about forrest gump (laughs) well i mean with Forrest Gump, like, I kind of see that as the beginning of, like, the nostalgic, like, self-reflective voice being, like, the entirety of the canon. Like, I see that as the, that's the moment where that began. And that's the moment where movies became about, like, you know, taking the past and boiling it down and homogenizing it and sanitizing it and making it a happy story and making the people who did bad things feel bad about it and making the things that like we should be like we should make basically making us feel bad about the things we did bad in the past but like not actually like talking about doing anything better for the future and just continuing the same patterns of like the image of like the male who like can lead the family and goes off to war and has a successful business and that shit. And like those signifiers, those, those icons, those images that like don't really mean anything in and of themselves. And in kind of many cases aren't like very negative for uh, people psychologically and for the world, just in a general sense. Like I see that is the beginning of, where really we can see it as becoming very apparent is this is the new cultural voice. Like the shift happened with 
I believe, with uh, Forrest Gump. Because Forrest Gump, like, is that. Forrest Gump is that, like, we're, we're cleansing the American 20th century uh, of of the negative. And we're making it, we're showing it through the eyes of someone who, like, is like a child. And look, isn't it great that we went through all this? You know, it was so hard. There was ups and downs, but we're here. We're, we're still, still here. here. And isn't that what's important? And it's the same fucking bullshit that you see in movies like the Chicago 7. And that's why, personally speaking... I'm going to go off a little bit on a movie. Uh, that's why I like the Benjamin Button movie, because the Benjamin Button movie is basically saying, like, actually, the American 20th century was us believing we were doing good, but really we were doing nothing. We were just standing in place, because that's what that character does. He doesn't mean anything beyond the miracle of his birth. And that's the joke of that film. It's incredibly cynical. People who don't like Benjamin Button are insane. insane. But that's basically my encapsulation of, like, how I think, like, the fucking, like, there's so much, like, there's just so much in Forrest Gump that just says so much about, like, the neoliberal capitalist realism, like, taking over, not only, like, through the economics and through other uh, institutions and channels of power, but, like, directly through our culture started with Forrest Gump. And, like, you have to remember that the year before that was Jurassic Park, which was the movie that started the blockbuster craze in the modern era, which, you know, mm-hmm. Spielberg started in the 70s. And what we've seen, that's a fucking brilliant place to repeat Hauntology is because we're just getting the same fucking stories over and over again of like, you know, militaristic superhero movies just over and over again. We're trying to feel bad about Iraq, all of the Iraqs that we've done. And, you know, that is that's capitalist realism. That is what it is. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, capitalist realism, right? That's the other big thing that Fisher built this idea of acid communism on or, um, you know, that led him to. Uh, develop it um the belief that there's no there is no alternative to capitalism what is yeah there's this saying it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism which makes which, sense. which everyone has said it's not even yeah. worth attributing the quote to someone at this point uh, right i don't <laughs> even know who said it i couldn't find a i think when i googled it or when i found it or maybe you put that there no i put that there because it's in black uh yeah i don't think there was like a single source for that quote um yeah so here we are we are it's always we're always gonna go with the devil that we know and that's true on a a cultural scale it's true on a personal scale i've you know as someone who's been in been in like shitty relationships that that happens like it's really hard sometimes to leave a shitty relationship because the person is familiar and you do have so much like emotional investment in them we are invested in we grew up in a capitalist world you know our all of our childhood memories are tied to things that are inextricable from capitalism it's it's like even you know even for those of us who are kind of trying to be on the edges and and imagine a new world it's hard to get free of that because it's in your head it's in there and it's so that's the thing so that's the other You know, we'll talk about this more later, probably, but that's part of why psychedelics are valuable, because they confront you with yourself and the things, the assumptions that you have and the emotional ties you have to stuff. So we also kind of were thinking about, in terms of capitalist realism and ontology, I guess, um, and this failure of imagination, there are creative people alive today, but, you know, if you are a creative person producing things and you operate within capitalism you are still like what is it within capitalism creativity must be profitable and like people doing anything creative artists you know even filmmakers whatever people who are professional creatives are still forced because of the system they operate in to you know rush their art there's always time limits so that like that alone limits the potential of whatever you're creating. Uh, I could talk about that forever, forever. Um, but I already have <laughs> in a different episode. And they have to make sure that what they're producing is commodifiable and that there's enough of it um, so that other people will buy it so that they can have money to to survive. I guess I wrote here also that my undergrad degree was basically an art degree, but I never really saw myself becoming an artist and I it took me a very long time to realize that part of this is that if you are a professional artist a fine artist or whatever uh today in order like the stuff that sells is drama and the stuff that is dramatic in artists lives is like their own emotional trauma and a lot of artists end up using their traumas 
as inspiration. So they're basically commodifying it. They're commodifying their traumas and in order to, you know, survive. And it's, I don't know, it's just, you know, sex work is work. But I think I, I did write down here that that is kind of this, like the ultimate kind of um, like spiritual prostitution. You're sort of offering up the darkest and most painful parts of yourself and saying, here, please consume this so that I can survive. And that is, that's a lot, you know, it's, it's a lot. Very important point, though. One of the primary ways that capitalism creates its sense of realism and controls uh, the narratives of past struggle and of revolutions is through the production of scarcity, uh, both artificial and actual. Uh, with like actual scarcity comes from the fact that like as capitalism keeps repurposing itself and keeps using actual materials to do such because capitalism is a profit motive that requires uh, consumption to keep existing. You know, as that keeps going on, the reality is we're going to actually run out of things. We're going to actually lose resources. We're going to deplete the earth of what it needs to survive. We're going to turn it into a husk. And a way that capitalism distracts you from the fact, distracts you from the the reality, the realism that we, you know, are heading headlong into this inevitability is it creates as like the scarcity of time you know and by creating a scarcity of time through your job through your commute commute excuse me all these various little annoyances and and requirements that you have to do to keep up with the pressures of ca- capitalism to keep up with the pressures of the nine to five world uh it creates a scarcity of time which cripples our interpretation and ability to create our own sense and forms of freedom you know it it teaches us that we can only achieve freedom through work and through like embracing that profit uh, driven model and through embracing the chains that we're shackled to. And basically this is how like neoliberalism destroyed the collectivist revolution, revolutionary thought by creating a new type of hyper individualism. It's fully committed to a transactional and entirely subjective relationship to the world and fellow humans. And is completely unable to imagine any sort of collective strife any sort of collective action yeah um and that thing about the scarcity of time that's like this is something that this is a a drum that i beat constantly because this is what i'm talking about when i say capitalism is in In your your head head. this is a cultural force it's completely artificial it's one of those fictions that we just all accept as being real but we're not aware of it and it's it's just so incredibly oppressive we do have an episode. I don't even remember if we called the episode "Reclaiming Our Time," but we I did. Did, did I we? Did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We did. Great. <laughs> yeah. Um. That's an episode where I just yak about this one subject for a really long time. Um. But yeah, recommend. <laughs> would recommend it. Um. Because it's it's so it's so like it just makes me so mad. It makes me so mad. Um. Anyway, and like talking about this situation where we're now you know neoliberalism has led us to be completely unable to like imagine like collective well-being and the way you know it's changed the way we relate to each other it's it's really like it's really we we don't even we're not even aware of the importance of non-transactional relationships like actually com truly comradely or caring or you know, brotherly, I guess you could say, siblingly relationships. We we aren't taught, like, you know, maybe our kindergarten teacher kind of, you know, you, you learn about this stuff when you're very young, but then once you're being molded into a functional adult, you're not really taught these things. And a lot of our parents don't really understand all this stuff. We grew up, like, not really, not really knowing that, you can and ought to, for your own health, have a lot of interpersonal relationships that are fundamentally non-transactional, where you do things for the other person because you want to, because you care about them, and you're concerned for their well-being and their concern for yours. I think <laughs> I put some note here that uh, some humans, it's theorized that some humans aren't actually capable of that kind of relationship at all. 
Oh, yeah. I put that because, you know, we call those people narcissists. And one of them has been living in the White House for four years. Oh! <laughs> fucking owned, I... Mr. President. Got owned. <laughs> you could also make the argument that Obama's a narcissist by that definition. Oh, well, yeah. I don't think anybody would contend that at all. Yes, absolutely. I know that he is because I have, uh, I've had many friends who have had narcissists for, like, parents and, you know. I'm not going to try and pump Obama up, obviously, but I don't think he's, as a person, I don't think he's a narcissist in the way that Trump is. I think, I want to say more Trump than Obama would be, like, the, the post-human capitalist instead of the post-capitalist human. And so, with but with Obama, it's like, I do think the root of Obama is narcissism, but it's like neoliberal narcissism, whereas like Trump, it's just capitalistic. None of this matters. Just having fun. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But an issue with trying to create a post-capitalist world is that everything before capitalism itself can be defined and categorized against capitalism. While the world, this is why psychedelic intelligence is important, is is, is, psychedelic intelligence, yes, but psychedelic consciousness is important is that you know a world after capitalism can be hard to envision and especially can be hard to articulate in a way that you can create a following behind or like because again like we're talking about a long ways away but we're also talking about like a fucking field that none of us have ever seen let alone been on so it's hard Mm -hmm. to like conceptualize conceptualize that for people and so like one of the purposes of, of acid communism is to try to have that that collective psychedelic experience and to fight that the capitalist realism. Because like we are inside capitalism and there is an outside world that we can't see. It's a it's a post-capitalist world, and like acid communism, the point is to bring us to the border between the two worlds and to try to make it so that we can like maybe peek over the wall a little bit but not necessarily like live there because you know, we can't, we're all born with the matrix of capitalism in our brains. Cause we've been taught since, since our birth to be good capitalist liberal subjects in America. Like we can't do this, but we can try to envision with, uh, with acid communism, with psychedelic consciousness and because it's a transitory project. Mark Fisher said that what if the counterculture the 60s counterculture is what he means when he says the counterculture, the 60s, 70s counterculture. He says, what if the counterculture was just only a stumbling beginning? I mean, I don't know how relevant this is, but I don't think it's an accident that when you look at the counterculture of the 60s and 70s and some of the things that kind of rose out of it, um, speaking of like, uh, just I guess some of the more popular ones like Osho, if you watch the documentary on Netflix and stuff like that, very, very... Yeah. What, was this? what is this documentary? And the idea of, of uh, oh, okay. wild, wild, wild country. Mm-hmm. Off the rails yeah. and something else. But no, but I mean, there was other experiments to kind of, I mean, I don't know. They always ended up bordering on cults, which of course is going to uh, knock them down. But I don't think it's, it's an accident that that was such a major part of the experiment when talking about this type of stuff is that type of communal living, that type of doing capitalism in the name of, I guess, a higher uh, purpose, higher plateau. It's and a good way to put it, higher plateau. We're talking. But, it's, but, but I think yeah. that to call like a stumbling block. Yeah, like, what I was trying to say uh, stumbles right there, was what if the counterculture like was just only a stumbling beginning rather than the best that we could hope for? What if the success of neoliberalism was not an indication I, of the inevitability of capitalism, but a testament to the scale of the threat posed by the specter of a society which could be free? That was what Mark Fisher said about the 60s. That it might have just been like an era of heightened consciousness that like how i like to look at these things is it's all like it's eternal return it's the circles over and over again and each time the circle gets wider and each time we get more and more and each time we catch more and i was saying that for the listener well i know you've read this <laughs> yeah that makes sense though like eventually just <laughs> leaving orbit eventually i'm gonna go cosmic with this i should be on more drugs do um, it yeah but yeah the idea of like circling around the gravity of capitalism finally letting go and going do off it. into some do sort it. of an orbit into whatever comes next. We tell capitalism to do that. Yeah. I like that. This is all really, um, I have like a huge personal emotional investment in all of this because, so my mom was a flower child. 
She lived in the Bay Area of California in the late 60s, including in 67, the Summer of Love. And uh, having her as a mother was, it's a big part of why I am who I am and what I'm, I'm, and the fact that I'm interested in what I'm interested in. Like, she gave me her worldview. Um, and my father, incidentally, also kind of accidentally gave me the opposite worldview. And so I had to really, like, spend a lot of time determining which one was the best. <laughs> um, but I feel like not just her, but a lot of people, a lot of women especially, um, I think ended up being very disillusioned by the whole but I guess you could call it the failure of the counterculture um I think it it was kind of a stumbling beginning whatever but I really like it's it's not only important to me to to do this exploration to do this imagining and doing do this work trying to bring us closer to yeah a society which could be free um for myself and for my comrades and for the world but for you know my mom and for for everyone of her generation that you know probably felt this hope and this because it was a much more spiritual thing than the left of today um and that's a that's the kind of spirituality that um i am personally aligned with myself um and yeah, I it's just there's it's just really like it's all real personal for me. Yeah, I guess <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. Although you did just write here, um, Scott, that which we could sort of lead into the fact that this quote, "Acid communism points to something that at one point seemed inevitable, but which now appears impossible," which is the convergence of class consciousness and socialist feminist consciousness raising and psychedelic consciousness. <laughs> yeah, and I put a I put a dark crystal reference in here because I love that movie and there's something in it called The Great Conjunction, which is pretty hilarious. Um I don't Also, do... this is the uh, consciousness of the Navi and Avatar. I just wanted to say that. Hey, I knew I it forgot was going to be Avatar that. talk. You must, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've still never seen that movie. It's good. It's uh, it's, it's great. I I didn't get it the first time, but it's great. I'm going to share my screen real fast just so I could. I almost had a heart attack because I thought like Craig left or something. So <laughs> No, <laughs> I literally just want to play like 10 seconds of this dark crystal scene where they're talking about the Great Conjunction. I don't even have I don't know if you can hear it even. No. I cannot. cannot. You can't hear it? Okay, never mind. I'll just send that to Scott. Send me the link and I'll put it in. The great conjunction comes. Now we will live forever. Navi are communist. Yeah, they plug their brains into the tree. Like the point about uh, like neoliberalism having like destroyed people's ability to think in non-transactional ways. I think my parents are like the perfect embodiment of that because to them everything is like a transaction, and they were definitely raised in like the the heyday of the neoliberal days, like in the eighties and nineties. It's I'm sorry to hear that. Very, very. It's very disturbing. Does it manifest in kind of like a what can you do for me type of way? Absolutely. It's actually quite explicit. Uh, what can you do for me and what am I getting out of this? Yeah. Why are you doing something that doesn't like directly benefit you? Or like, why do you care about rent control so much even though you're not paying rent? I don't, that's not, um, I think, unique to your parents or any generation whatsoever. Because that ends up being a talking point for anybody entrenched in it from any era. 
you know what I mean? I'll talk to college kids nowadays that have those type of feelings even too. And the only one I've got on my side is the blood sucking lawyer. <laughs> it's not limited to like rent control, but I was using an example at like the first one that comes off the top of my head. No, for sure. But it's, it's, it's appropriate, incredibly appropriate because it's a very similar conversation I've had with 40 somethings. Gen Xers are the worst. Oh yeah. They, they drank the Kool-Aid hard. <laughs> now we're just complaining. <laughs> yeah, I know. This, this little bit has turned into like, Fuck you, Ben Stiller. Very personal conversations about our families. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to go back for a second to the rest of this uh, Mark Fisher quote that I'm stealing from Scott here. Um, it's fine. <laughs> what he's saying, he's saying um, the fusion of a, a new, what, what we, we want the fusion of a new social movement with a communist project and an unprecedented aestheticization Am I saying that right? Aestheticization? Aestheticization of everyday yeah. life. And I thought that was so great because, as I understand it, that means, like, you have to make, you know, be, be caring about each other and, like, doing cool communist stuff and, like, doing, like, you know, growing your own food and stuff. You gotta make that cool. Yeah. It's celebrating the, those mundane, like, like, things that we do which in the long run actually benefit each other as exactly comrades. it's making those things fashionable and that like fucking you want to talk about aestheticism like that's what oscar wilde said like it's, yeah everybody cool has been on our side so <laughs> <laughs> fucking oscar wilde he was a looker man he was a very pretty man <laughs> <laughs> but he was like super it's gay true. if I remember correctly. <laughs> Indeed he was. Yeah, that portrait keeping him young. Oh yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I mean anyway, so obviously right now what's cool is like wealth and power. And so there's a lot of work to be done. But you know, Fisher was Yeah, Martin Screlly shit is cool. Right. <laughs> does does anybody else realize how indoctrinating shows like Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous were? Yeah. Hell yeah. Like, I think of that. Cribs. Oh, oh perfect example. Pimp yeah. my fucking ride. Yeah. Well, pimp my ride was a little different, but yeah. I'm glad I was young enough that that was a little bit before my time. You yeah. missed wonders. That may be part of why Gen Z has so much potential, because they were too young for yeah, a lot of the worst of it. They would take, like, somebody's, like, shitty-ass Bronco and put, like... <laughs> A stove and a carpet, like a disco Step ball, dog. with like a sound system in it, like not improve anything <laughs> no, about the car's like structure or anything. <laughs> so a week like later, the car would just the end like and yeah, the car. <laughs> we heard you like yeah. we heard you like room. So we put a room inside your room so you could room while you've room or whatever. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> like pure wonderful. Insanity Joe. That's all I'm saying. Take a minute to wrap my head around the fact that people actually watch this for entertainment. I enjoyed it. It was entertaining. It was very entertaining. It was so, it was, it was seriously, it was staring into the sun. It was so, it was wonderful. It was just pure oh God, yeah. fucking. And, and now he was making me think, and now I've got the image of my head when Trump was literally staring into the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the sensation of staring into the eclipse. You're just you're seeing too much, and you know it. <laughs> but, but you it's can't so stop. Awe inspiring, but you can't <laughs> stop looking at it. Yeah. I feel like we could go more into my ride because I don't know how that wasn't like as brainwashing as all the other shows like Cribs and stuff we were talking about. There's something like, 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 There's a lot we, there. Yeah. There's a lot there. I, I, there's gotta be something to dissect about that. I mean, they, they tried to help out guys who were in some bad shape. Again, offer no actual material change. Maybe you could sell the 16 TVs to afford a like, car that worked. But. If you go back and watch the show, like, they, like Ja Rule or whoever the fuck it was, like, was actually there. Exhibit. Like, Exhibit. Sorry, uh, we all went down here for that. It was very mean. It was very negative towards poverty and towards being poor, like incredibly so. People are still like that. People are still. I had a friend who was really obsessed with um this guy Jeffrey Star, who is like a self made uh queer um like makeup mogul kind of. Yeah, it's like the YouTube. Yeah, person. and 
It was always in controversial. And bullshit. there was like we watched an episode of I think his show where like some fan got a chance to meet go meet Jeffrey Star and he was like you know, they had the the camera on him while he was in the car driving to where Jeffrey Star lived and he was like, Oh my god, I'm so poor. I'm so poor and everyone here is so rich. He like literally kept saying that. He kept being like like pointing out self-effacingly to Jeffree Star that he was so poor and like therefore like not worthy of being in Jeffree Star's presence. <laughs> it was just so gross. Popular YouTube, baby. Anyway, yeah. Well, we got Yeah, so Will, you were right. Yeah. Uh whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but how we are very heavily indoctrinated by popular culture. Yeah, and which makes that Fisher quote all the more uh, appropriate. Yeah, we got to make the so main we have, game cool again. Fuck yeah. Go watch some slow cinema. I don't know why. That's what my brain immediately like jumped to. But like, if you really like, I'm serious. Like, like Kelly Reichardt is actually like very, like her movies are very much spirited with uh, mm. these types of things. Uh, anyways. Um, and she usually employs slow cinema elements. But like, I don't really think she's all like pure. Like, she's like, there's a very big difference between like, Reichardt and like Bell- Bellatar, but like whatever, fuck it, who cares? Um, <laughs> this. So we have to return. What? Well, yes, well, no, you want to talk about again, like, slow cinema? <laughs> no, 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 it's not slow cinema. As far as like adjusting the um, aestheticization or whatever it was, I when I was thinking about this topic, one thing that I wanted to bring up was the whole transcendental movement, uh, American transcendentalism too, because that had a, I think, a lot of this. I mean, like. Oh, like in the 19th century kind of thing? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That they was were all Marx bit. contemporaries. And they all kind of knew what Marx was going on, and they all kind of had a very similar take on it. But obviously the Transcendentals had a much more... Like, yeah, Thoreau, Emerson, yeah, yeah, Emerson. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the Emerson, oh, yeah. they were all Good anarchists, stuff. more or less. If you look at kind of like what they believe the function of the state and society... Thoreau was, was, I think, in a more genuine sense, Thoreau was the only anarchist, but... yeah, I mean, But yeah, there's they... something to be said about their... I guess, entertainment source, which obviously they didn't have cable and whatever the dude's name is on all these shows and stuff like that. And all they had was to go stare at a pine cone for six hours a day or something. But I, there's something to be said about that no longer being like people, you say you go, I looked at the woods, I took a walk, whatever, I went deliberately, whatever the third line is. You're looked at as a loony mountain man. Right. By the common folk. Say that, you know. Is that. Uh, Thoreau said that? Yeah, that was I, one of the Ooh. main lines of Walden. Yeah, I mean, it's like, why would you want to sit in the woods and watch ants fighting each other? Even hey, though ants oh, fighting each other awesome. is dope, yeah. <laughs> like, seriously. Dude, throw a spider in the mix and see what you get. What was that, Joe? Yeah, plus if you have your own cabin, you're not gonna have to pay in rent. You're yeah. own sh- like shitty landlord. You just gotta like take care of it on your own, which is like you know That's hard work. That's the thing work. that my mom did. But still, you can't do better. that anymore. Too. I had a conversation yeah. with a guy about this. I'm like, where can you go? Just live in the woods, like nowhere. At some point, a ranger's gonna be like, dude, get the fuck out. This isn't yours. Yeah, for real. Mm. That was a sidebar. We'll do more transit. We are envious later. of you, uh, Henry David. Fuck. Henry David fuck. <laughs> Henry David you fuck. So we have to return to a pre a pre neoliberal time of class consciousness and socialist feminist consciousness. Uh the radical times of the 60s and 70s. Uh we have to be like we have to become fully aware, we have to be made fully aware of our oppressions, of our subjugations. And we have to be made fully aware of the different ways of looking at things, a new ontology. And that's the purpose of like the psychedelic experience. It's is a fundamental questioning of time and space, our relationship to existence, our world. And in the 60s and 70s, uh, the psychedelic community was much more successful with bringing a lot of these ideas to the mainstream, which, you know, Will, you already mentioned yeah. that um, in popular culture and such. And yeah, actually... Um... I think it was Terrence McKenna, but it might have been somebody in one of those videos you linked um, to us. It said that even at that time, you know, in the 60s and 70s, comedy and humor, um, popular humor as we as we knew it, 
um, was affected by the entrance of psychedelics into the culture. And it was just, you know, not not everybody was doing acid. Not everybody needs to be doing acid for that kind of change to happen. You literally just need a few people on the fringes. Um, I put literally Avant Lagarde because I'm uh, it's not nosed intellectual. Um, and you just need those people, those few people to be there who are able to then like bring their new perspectives into the culture through through whatever connections that they happen to have. I appreciate the use of the, use of the word psychonauts. Yeah. In the notes. Psychedelia doesn't mean drugs necessarily. Uh, though drugs can be you. What's up, Joe? Good sec. You're welcome. Uh, though drugs can be useful in the pursuit of a higher consciousness, the psychedelic experience is about questioning reality. Uh, and we can see psychedelia in many things, from mass media to our own revolutionary thoughts that we share on our smartphones. You know, like, what I mean by that is that, like, we have the ability to communicate with each other through different, like, time zones and different, like, countries and locations and all this shit through the internet. And that's basically, like, kind of breaking apart our understanding of the fragments of, like, reality. Uh, like, we have screens that are able to contrast time and space. Like, through the internet, we're able to communicate with people all over the world in different time zones in an instant, like I said. It's like a form, it's, you know, it's, 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 you can interpret drugs as a type of technology, but you can also interpret, like, obviously, the internet is a type of technology. And we, like, will, because we're trapped in this matrix and because, you know, we don't always have the ability or we don't always reach a, po a like point of being spiritually sound with ourselves enough to like have a, a, like a, that like, type of like higher perspective or like an ego death or something that like some of us need technology to reach these points in that way through the internet or through drug use or through like whatever collective efforts like it's it's re-territorializing what was previously de-territorialized by capital but like in a more like open in collective space across like a different type of plane, which is like the plane of time and space through the internet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like psychedelia is about, it's about like breaking down boundaries and barriers, not just between ourselves, also within ourselves, um, between ourselves and the rest of humanity, the world as a whole. Um, I've personally never used acid because I take, uh, when I was 19, I was probably misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder, so I've been on lithium for 14 years, and if you take lithium and acid together, you will probably have seizures and have to go to the hospital. So I've never done acid. But right. yeah, I mean, you don't need drugs. You don't need drugs to do, um, to have a psychedelic experience. Scott's right. You could, you know, this whole thing with the internet... Um, I think I wrote here, uh, yeah, so, like, the Arab Spring happened, you know, in 2010, 2011, 2012, and it probably would not have happened without this collective action that was enabled by social media and the internet. But all this is also related to uh, Foucault's limit experience, as he defined it, like, there's many different... But he's not the only person who's talked about it. Uh, <laughs> but a limit experience is an experience that happens both at and beyond the limit of ordinary experience, basically. What I mean is, like, it's an experience of the outside of the wall of capitalism, more or less, you know? It's another experience. It's the experience of going to that, go into that border and being able to see beyond it and being able to see, like, what is possible. And Foucault related it heavily to his use of LSD. Like, that was a revolutionary moment for him in his life. It brought him to the border he became much more revolutionary in his thought after that. And basically, um, though we exist in this matrix of capitalism, it, making it almost impossible to imagine the outside, these experiences are key to understanding how to question the reality and paradigm of our, experience, of our lives, of the capitalism. The capitalism. Um, and I've also never done acid. I would like. I would like to. Maybe, I'd like to too. I'm yeah, actually you know. trying to get my psychiatrist to wondering, help wondering. Me not be on lithium anymore. So that I, not so that I can mm. do acid, but that is the thing that I would <laughs> like to do. Drugs are fun. That's the subtext of this current conversation. It's true. Oh, this is a wicked drugs are fun episode. And yeah. I, yeah, and I will uh, say, yes. I will say and that I can say they are fun. They are fun. 
<laughs> they are fun. I will say that, you know, ketamine is something that you could argue provides a somewhat psychedelic experience. I fucking love ketamine. I will say that for the record. <laughs> and even um, just weed, like marijuana does not, it doesn't operate on the same receptors in your brain that like psilocybin and, and LSD and all these other things do. But it is actually, one thing it does is it sort of confronts you with yourself, with your own psychic contents. And sometimes that's fun and sometimes it's not fun. But uh, I don't think I, it was actually, personally, weed has been instrumental to the personal growth that I've experienced over the past, you know, like eight, nine years. And sometimes it was terrifying and I had panic attacks, but, you know, I kept going back and I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all. Excellent. Yeah, so when you end up in these, you know, psychedelic experiences take us to the the borderlands, I guess, so that we can we can see off the edge and get um Hell yeah. Hell new yeah. perspective. Perspective is so it's such a I put it in all caps because it's such an important word. Like basically perspective is like getting a new input, a new angle of input on your situation and it's makes it so much easier it's critical it's critical to gaining further and deeper and higher understanding of yourself your choices your the society you're in whatever um and because of that it's critical to envisioning and pursuing new futures oh yeah and i actually was even going to specifically say that i have used ketamine regularly as a uh, perspective providing thing, like as a self-reflection tool, um, like just a life path tool. It's great for me, and especially because it allows me to go to a place where I am not Hava and I am not Ellie. So that's another thing. Like it helps me as a person with a dissociative disorder. It helps me like figure out how I can function and what I like should do and the choices, what choices I should make and stuff like that. So you ever done acid? Uh, what? What? <laughs> yes. 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 Oh boy. But, Will. Nah, no, only mushrooms. I enjoy those. Doesn't that, Count though, and like I said, uh, anyways, they're a different animal from what I understand, not having enough personal experience. But I mean, I've done psychedelics, yeah, they're not animals, they're plants. <laughs> well, <laughs> mushrooms, what did I say? mushrooms oh, I are more like uh, we, we have more in common <laughs> with mushrooms than we do with uh, with uh, plants. I forget, mushrooms are more like humans than they are more like uh. biologically. I've also done mushrooms, but I think uh, partially because of the fact that I also take. Um, uh, antipsychotic medication. Um, I haven't had a, like like a whole lot of great experiences. I had a couple pretty good experiences with them, but nothing you know, nothing like mind expanding. I like the the curtains turned wiggly. You know, it's I had some Ooh, wiggly, Ooh, wiggly, wiggly curtains. curtains. That was bad. <laughs> so I don't. Yeah, I, don't do I found it was. Anymore. It was nothing revelatory to me. I did not come up with like any sort of a new way of thinking about things. It reinforced a lot of the thinking I already had. Exorbitant. Oh yeah, this is good stuff. Talk about it. This is good stuff. It's a pretty heady concept. I still don't really... Anyways, it has something or an experience that exists outside and beyond capitalism, usually not something that can be accessed from within capitalism, but for brief moments. Culture from the radical era had a clearer vision and expressed these ideas more sufficiently. These moments, oh, these are with them. These are moments of exorbitant sufficiency. Basically, it's the quiet optimism in the future of the world as there were more progressive victories relative than there are today in the 60s and 70s. Um, we can see that as more of an era of exorbitant sufficiency uh, before. And basically, like, that's why, you know, I sort of explicitly drawn this conclusion in the notes that's why i think like neoliberalism was employed was developed it was because you know there were those progressive victories in the 60s and 70s there were those moments of exorbitant sufficiency and that i think that like you know capital had that moment of 
we're going to just dig the nail in deeper of we're going to become more of a hyper individualist sort of form of like proto fascism. Uh, and that's what we've seen in this era after the sixties and seventies. That's what we've seen. That's what has come to bear. That's what has come to arise. I wrote that, uh, exorbitant, ex- ugh, exorbitant sufficiency sounds like kind of like electrical charge. Like you can just build it up and build it up and like, you know, maybe maybe in the 60s and 70s they built it up and they built it up, but then they kind of, either they kind of lost it, things kind of went astray, or, you know, I mean, it, it, that's, when did the war on drugs start? Like, 71. So, arguably, you could say that neoliberalism, the assault of neoliberalism is kind of what what killed it, what what de, de, decharged it, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know things about like did you say 71 isn't that when the war on drugs started june 18th 1971 okay yeah bravo good yeah, old nixon exactly. yeah that's the thing about nixon he was evil and he was smart he was he was too smart to he was smart in his yeah. evilness and he but he was i'd say he was too evil in the end good will always triumph because evil is dumb Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, to be clear, that's my reworking of a quote from Spaceballs. It is not a direct quote. Sometimes you gotta do that, you know? Gotta rework quotes till they say what you want them to say. All right, these are the steps of class consciousness (laughs) according to the philosopher Mike. What is funny about my transitions, dude? This is what I do on the show. (laughs) If it was Joe laughing at you, just remember that Joe is blessed with the the thing where everything is funny. We love him. (laughs) We love him. I'm sober, yet everything is still funny. Bless, the bless brutal you, murder of the of the bless elderly you. is just he oh it's <laughs> run through the field laughing about it. Oh my god! <laughs> Thank you for that. What the reference for? I, now I'm just Joe in a field. Oh my god! He's in slow motion. He's running around. Oh, I love it. <laughs> love him. Uh, but these, according to the philosopher, not the director nor climate scientist Michael Mann. These are the steps of class consciousness. Step, Step one, one, self-recognition. The, the acknowledgement that you yourself are working class. Step two is recognition of the opponent that you, as working class, are against the bourgeoisie. Uh, and then class totality. So bleh, class totality, which is basically you are working class and thus you are part of a working class. And that's the word. And if you are against the bourgeoisie, then you are, as the working class, against the bourgeoisie. And that's the working class is against the bourgeoisie. And you are a part of the working class against the bourgeoisie. And then transcendence, which is the working class, comes together to create a new society and overtakes and destroys the bourgeoisie. Communism. Communism. There it is, as it, as the, as Jeffrey uh, Jeffrey Jones's character in Amadeus often said, "There it is." I've seen that. Oh, movie it's such once. a good movie. Now we're just gonna kind of like I I just put this section of notes here that are totally unrelated to anything else. Actually, that's not true. Yeah, um, um, I'm yeah, gonna let is... Ellie or excuse me, I'm gonna let Shava go, and I will just respond. We're all we're all the peanut gallery now, folks. Hell yeah. Also, um, I'm sorry that I picked a name that's really hard to say, but it's it's Chava. And if if you want, I'm you can sorry, say. I'm sorry, I'm a stupid white person. Hava. Just say Chava is fine if you can't make the Ch noise. Um. Anyway, yeah, I wrote <laughs> this thing. All of this made me think of a great uh, Jacobin article called "Fear of a Capitalist Planet," which I would highly recommend googling and reading, which was about how 
we are basically pathologically terrified of aliens, largely because we can't really imagine, just as we can't really imagine a society beyond capitalism, we cannot really imagine aliens who would not treat us uh, the way we treat each other. Um, in terms of like, you know, I mean, like exploitatively and not and transactionally and all of that. And obviously, we, there are a lot of people who say that they've gotten probed. So that kind of contributes to that, to be fair, to be fair. Um, but it's it's a it's an interesting idea. Like this, this failure of imagination extends so far that we just assume that like aliens would want to all aliens would want to probe us probe us and dump us in a field, you know? So, like, of course we're scared of them. Is this, is this the field that I'm apparently running in? <laughs> I hope mm-hmm. not, because I don't want you to get abducted by aliens and probed. But but, but now I can't can't not imagine that. <laughs> so they... Yep. It, it's only going to be the fields that you're running through. Oh, now. my God. Yeah, we keep talking about a field. We, ca- we keep talking about this new Imaginera as a field that none of us have ever been to. <laughs> Just like, be a meadow. No one has been to this meadow except for Joe, and he's uh, gonna get abducted by. Aliens. If anybody was gonna get abducted by aliens that I know, I mean, that would be. I would love to see. I. I would. I don't want to say I would love to see Joe get abducted by aliens. Wait, what? I would. I would not per se love to see that, but I feel like you and your attitude would just be like, "What the fuck is happening?" Like you wouldn't go quietly. Be like, "What are you doing?" Oh, I would not be going. I- Quietly to anything. Exactly. Yeah. Even even getting abducted by aliens um, from this the meadow of the future. Joe would make the aliens regret abducting. Oh, he would. He would. He oh, would absolutely. That, yeah. that is like a skill set. You would find a way, and it would be beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, jumping around again, uh, I want to kind of return briefly to the idea that psychedelics expose you to yourself. I think. Uh, I think this kind of happens this is one of the first things that the psychedelic experience kind of provides for you is you know you have to know yourself and transform yourself before you can do external work before you can imagine that um that that meadow where joe's getting abducted uh this you know this is a really critical part and again yeah you don't have to take drugs to do this and actually something that you know, a pretty good alternative if you can't or don't want to take drugs is like spiritual practice. Personally, I have been a an adherent of what's called bhakti yoga. Um, it is a a I believe a based it's based in Hinduism. It's a practice um, that was it, I think it was sort of brought to the West in back in the in the era in the sixties and seventies. That's when um, people from the West were going to India and bringing this stuff back, and they also uh, gurus from India were coming to the West and introducing traditions like this. Um, if anybody is curious, I would highly recommend checking out Bhakti Yoga. There is a great brief little website um, called the Ramdas Starter Kit, I believe is the name of it. Um, let me just make sure that's actually what it's called. Um, yeah. Yeah, literally just Google Ramdas starter kit. Ramdas is R A M space D A S S. And he was, I don't want to say he was my guru per se, but he basically was. Um, he was a very cool dude who grew up um, as a contemporary, actually, of Timothy Leary. He was a psychologist, psychology professor at Harvard back in the 50s. He's basically just a Jewish guy from Boston ultimately, um, who got into psychedelics and got into um, bhakti yoga. And uh, it's it's really cool. It's basically just about, you know, learning to, he calls it polishing the mirror. He, he, it's, it's about like learning to open your heart and be of service to other people. Um, it's about learning to extend love and comradeship towards other people and yourself. And it's cool. I mean, it's not for everyone. It is a little bit. I think he uses, you know, the G word a lot. But I would, you know, if you, I was not raised in any. Um, gopher. Huh. Gopher. Go. Gopher. 
Sure, Scott. Yes, yes, gopher. <laughs> anyway, I didn't believe in gopher myself uh, until I was in my late twenties <laughs> because of because of bhakti yoga. You know, I wasn't raised. Um, I wasn't raised in any faith tradition at all. Um, I was very solidly agnostic for a very long time. Personally, I used bhakti yoga as kind of a kind of a guide guide post uh banister kind of thing for um my own personal growth and recovery from trauma um anybody who has trauma a trauma history which is a lot of us um you know dealing with that is tough and it helps to really have something to hold on to and spiritual practice can be that so that's why i would highly recommend that because i would i would recommend that as part of as a necessary part of this process of opening up our imaginations and imagining new futures, you really do have to get with yourself before you can get anywhere else. And we aren't really provided with a lot of ways to do that or teachings about the importance of that in our culture. So I guess take, 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 take me. I'm very envious of your lack of exposure to Gopher. I, I know. <laughs> I mean, I was kind of sad because it was... Like in the long run, yes, I'm actually very grateful that I was not that nobody tried to shove gopher down my throat when I was a kid. But on the other hand, I've also kind of come to Judaism as an adult, and that's Judaism is is like not just a religion; it's also kind of an ethnic heritage. And I feel like I used to have a lot of um, uh, kind of resentment that that was that that heritage was denied me by my grandfather, who decided not to raise his kids Jewish, but it's all sort of bygone, so it's, it's whatever. Um, taking psychedelics, doing doing psychedelic exploration, whether or not you are doing that with drugs or whatever, it can be scary, you know? It can be very, it can be hard, but it's it's worth it. That's the thing. It's like, once you get through it, it's really meaningful. It's like a meaningful and rewarding kind of practice. It's like, some, you know, it's, some, it's like having a kid, Person, I shouldn't say that because I don't have any kids and I don't intend to have kids, but you know what I mean. Like, it's one of those things that is really challenging, but like the challenges build up who you are. They like change you and make you grow. And it's, it's worth it. Like, it makes life worth living, you know? I think Hell yeah. ego death is a, is a phrase that's used a lot in, in this context. And yeah, ego death is really scary. It's really scary to realize that even though. It's it's sort of weird because you you kind of arrive at this point if 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 you follow at least if you follow like a spiritual tradition like bhakti yoga you you arrive at this point where you have this strange seemingly paradoxical dual awareness that a you as a person are like valid and you are worthy of love and you are loved and whatever and then also you are just a tiny little speck in the you are just a tiny cog in the the great machinery of the universe and you get to a place where you can see that and you can feel okay about it and you can be like dang that's, that's really, really awesome, awesome. 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 it's hard but it's worth it it's scary but it's worth it so how strange is it that we put like a, a monetary value on actual life itself. Mm. Right? Wow. It's yeah. a, just such a strange, strange concept. Yeah. Did you see that yeah, guy accidentally nothing. hit that moose with his car? No. <laughs> Holy oh. shit, Jamie, pull that video up. <laughs> I totally uh, just I responded to, to that thing. sound drop as though it was you guys talking. <laughs> yes, I loved that. That was wonderful. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm the worst. Anyway, um, yeah, okay, you're right. So this is this is the part where like I I'm, I'm probably gonna say a whole bunch of stuff, and you guys are definitely welcome to be my peanut gallery. Um, this is the point where, you know, okay, so so far we've talked about the the situation we're in, the necessary of getting out of it, and the necessary of imagining a new future, and how. You know, we're finding it hard as a culture to to even begin to do that, yada, yada. What I want to do, um, what I want to do now is even go one step further. And I'm glad, Will, that you brought up the fact that 
some of the transcendentalists were anarchists because this is the part where I reveal my giant black flag and uh, reveal that the only is- ism that I ever really identify personally with is anarchism. And yeah, I just want to kind of like offer a an idea of a, one possible future. Or rather, not not one possible future because it's not about really the outcome. It's about the principles of what I see as being necessary for a successful future beyond capitalism, whatever that may end up looking like. And there's a really great Terence McKenna quote that I put here. Um, got I think that it would be if you want to, like, take the quote from this YouTube video and just have Terrence McKenna saying it, that would be cool, but it's not necessary, maybe, because I think I cut out a big chunk in the middle and I don't remember. I don't know. Anyway, his voice is really great. I really love his voice. He is so funny. And I should say was, because unfortunately he passed away in, I think, 2001. Um, but I'll just say this quote anyway. And then you can cut it out later if you want. Um, He said, So much of culture is complex behavior. And I think that what the psychedelics show that is a secret that some people don't want told is that we can redesign our behavior. We can change very, very quickly. Uh, the image of ourselves as somehow the rigid inheritors of evolutionary programming and therefore doomed like lemmings or monarch butterflies to enact a programmed pattern of behavior and destroy ourselves isn't what I see happening at all. The whole history of humanness is a history of unexpected adaptive response to unusual circumstances. And I believe that's because the imagination has played such an important role in defining who and what we are. And whatever the imagination is, uh, psychedelics catalyze it. Psychedelics enhance it. And then later he says, Well, consciousness or the absence of it is what is pushing our species toward some kind of uh, uh, crack up. So if there are factors uh, in the rainforests, in the Arctic tundra, in the toolkits of pre-literate and aboriginal people that can act to transform consciousness, then we, we, this is where we have to put our attention. If we could feel the consequences of what we are doing, we would, we stop, would stop doing, doing. it. So... <laughs> I was actually just listening to this song earlier. I've been listening to it a lot lately. Um, and the song is Woodstock by Joni Mitchell. There's a great version by um, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And I actually found out that there's been just a jajillion covers of it. Like James Taylor covered it. It was pretty good. Um, but I like the original. I will make a note here because I think, Scott, it would be really great if we could put some quote, like a little clip of this either here or at the beginning or the end or like, I don't even know. You, I, I'll leave that up to you. But basically, the, the chorus of this song, Woodstock, is we are stardust. are obviously very biblical images um i think this was part of the the sort of spiritual nature of the counterculture in the 60s and 70s um they weren't really afraid to use extremely biblical language but you know it seems pretty obvious 
what the devil's bargain is. It's 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 capitalism. It's this endless self-perpetuating monstrous thing um, of transactional and exploitative relationships that we find ourselves in. So the question then is, what is the garden? And obviously that's that's a, a reference to the Garden of Eden, right? Another thing that I will admit to right now is that I've studied a, a little bit, a fair amount, I guess, of um, Kabbalah, Kabbalah, um, which is ancient Jewish mysticism. I've studied a lot of kinds of mysticism, actually. I'm like basically a mystic by, by hopefully by trade someday. I don't know. Um, but so, you know, what is the garden? I've, I've thought about this a lot. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and, a, a, you know, thinking about my experiences in life and how the, you know, how can we, uh, what is the garden? What, how do we get there? What, what's the deal? You know, so personally, I actually have kind of a fairly concrete idea of what those principles are. What are those things that you need in order to create the garden in your life, in your community, whatever? Um, and that's the thing. I think it really is something that pops up from the ground up. It's not something you can impose by force. It has to grow um, organically and it it spreads from there you know like covid <laughs> so like personally i was very lucky i i got to go to this awesome high school uh called york school which is in california and it was a small um independent private school co-ed um non-residential what was the name of the school it's again? called york school Park. Okay, that's what I thought you said. Yeah, I mean, look it up. It's pretty great. And one of the 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 one of the things about York was that um, a it was a place where the intellectually curious. It was sort of a place for the intellectually curious, for like people who really loved learning and loved creativity and loved um, service. And that was one aspect of it. And the other aspect was that it was intended to be relatively accessible. Um, unlike a lot of other private schools, it was designed, you know, there was always a lot of like financial aid available um, for kids who were um, not able to pay a pretty big chunk of money <laughs> to go there. I didn't realize accessible private schools were a thing. I mean, we were pretty special, <laughs> <laughs> right? And honestly, I mean, I graduated in 2005. The times have changed, things have changed. I cannot say for certain that it's exactly the way that it it was now. Um, but a lot of it was, you know, the teachers were great. That was a big part of it. I think there's still a lot of teachers there who are really great. Um, regardless. So for me, it was especially great because like, I was just, you know, completely socially rejected as a middle schooler. I spent three and a half years being bullied nonstop by the people I hung out with. And it destroyed my self-esteem, honestly. So one of the things was that, you know, my high school had a culture where people were, like, for the most part, pretty chill to each other. There was not a lot of us there. Um, there was this values, values-based values education thing where the we, we called it the three pillars of York, um, which were honesty, respect, and responsibility. And we were all pretty much expected to abide by those. Um, and ultimately, you know, there wasn't really a lot of clickishness. There was not a lot of crap that you get at your average high school. And ultimately, you know, like I was respected there as a person by my peers and by my teachers and everything. Um, I was cared for. It was great. I had a huge uh, like emotional breakdown when I was 16. And um, our head of school, our assistant head of school at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, who was this incredible woman named uh, Brenda Aronowitz, was one of my all time heroes. Um, she helped me, helped me like deal with that, which is, that's, in, you know, that's the kind of role that I want to fulfill in life for somebody. Um, you know, people looked out for me and people took me seriously and it was just really like really special. It was a really special place. As an adult, I've kind of felt that same, um, magic people have referred to it as magic in um spaces so 
I've been to Burning Man a few times. So I'll admit that. Uh, and oh, hell yeah. <laughs> there are what I think a lot of people don't really know is that there are a series of other small events called burns, which you know, um, Burning Man is a burn. And there's a lot of smaller events that are in the same spirit that happen all around the country. Um, one of my old roommates actually uh, organizes one that happens, usually happens in Connecticut every year. It didn't really happen this year, obviously, because of COVID. But that's a space where there are something called the 10 principles that are that guide those spaces. Um, there's, you know, I'm not going to go through all 10, but like radical inclusion is one of them. You know, it's like everyone is welcome. Um, communal effort is part of it. And, you know, you get these people drawn to these events that are really imaginative, really caring, and really, like, down to work together and do stuff, like, do the work, make things happen. And um, so, you know, you might, <laughs> I wrote here, you might find yourself eating poutine and raclette in the middle of the woods um, at a burn. You might find yourself, you know, you might find yourself having a lot of experiences where you're like, what? What the fuck is this? Wow. Um, Poutine in the woods sounds very questionable. I mean, no, it was legit. Like, there was this one theme camp. Oh, that sounds great. They were from Montreal. They called Midnight Poutine. Poutine, though? Okay. It was so good. <laughs> their, their poutine was so good. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was so no, good. I, okay. <laughs> Let me be clear. I don't have a problem with poutine. Mm-hmm. And I don't have a problem with eating in the woods. I have a problem with eating poutine. We did it. Uh, like they're <laughs> cooking it in a fire there, right? Like I'm just. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Everybody. They had like a whole kitchen set up. It was legit. It was like very legit. And yeah, I, I mean, like food preservation issues. God, I mean, like you know, the cheese curd is a part of poutine. So I mean. <laughs> Yeah, they made it work. I forget how. I mean, I, I never, like, went back into their camp and, like, looked at their stuff, but nobody ever seemed to, you know, have problems with the poutine or get sick or anything. So, it, was, it was fine. I've also, like, I've put a picture in the notes of this weird contraption that somebody brought to uh, Nectar, which is the one, the burn that my old roommate organizes uh, last year. And it's this weird, it's this weird thing <laughs> that, like... <laughs> It's sort of a windmill setup, and then you get on one of the spokes of the windmill, and then somebody else gets on the one behind it, and so forth until all four are filled, and then you kind of you kind of ride it all together, and it goes around, and you go upside down, and it's it's crazy. <laughs> but anyway, that that's to say that you know there's creativity there, there's there's boundary pushing there, and yeah, there's like you know it's not perfect. Um, I think I'll talk in a minute about Burning Man itself and the unfortunate infection of that culture by kind of the gross hyper-capitalism of Silicon Valley. Um, And obviously, like, you know, sometimes people kind of suck interpersonally. And if they are radically included, you might, you know, we there's a lot of sometimes there's drama that happens. You know, it's not perfect. But what I mean is like the principles of, of these kind of spaces. <clears throat> are are the critical part um i've honestly i've i've honestly had you know group living situations where i felt the same kind of magic it's really just this combination of care or comradeliness you could say um and communal effort and creative or imaginative collaboration again it can pretty much just start off as a dynamic between a few people maybe only like three people i don't know and it can grow and it can grow into a whole movement you know, that's how Burning Man happened. Um, yeah, that's, I guess, what I was going to talk about Silicon Valley. Uh, and just to say, that even that, like, there's so much there. Uh, I have an entire bookmark folder on my bookmarks called Californication, where I have saved various news stories about ridiculous things happening in Silicon Valley. And some of, the, some of those people go to Burning Man, and that sucks. Oh, man. But part we of- should be... Pick- I didn't know you had this. Like, like now I'm fascinated, and we should make this a part of the show. Anyways, you know, you're right. I mean, all of this stuff—they're all—it's all old. It's all like a couple of years old. 
Um, but I would be more than happy to talk about that shit because, oh God, that's why I loved Silicon Valley, the show so much because it's just so perfect. Um, it's such In perfect satire. It's perfect satire is what it is. Like I also have a lot of friends who uh, have worked in Silicon Valley or work there now. And they all corroborate for me that like everything on that show is just like perfectly re- researched and perfectly executed. And it's just gross and wonderful. And just, I don't know. Yeah. Check that show out. I forget what, uh, what network that was on, but um, it was HBO. HBO. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a Mike judge show. It's really great. Anyway, you can still you can still go to Burning Man, and I went the last time I went was in 2017, and I didn't encounter anybody who you know embodied this nasty Silicon Valley capitalist BS. But part of that is because Burning Man is huge. I think it was maybe sixty thousand people that time that I went, and it just seems to get bigger every time. So it seems like there is still a critical mass of this 10 10 principles oriented positivity and positive potential. So like, I don't know how that's going to turn out, but like so far, so far it's, it's not, it's not that bad. I don't know. Another thing is that I think that DSA actually has the potential to create spaces that have these sort of garden of Eden worthy um, qualities. We have the emphases on, comradeliness and mutual care um and that's pretty much the thing that i work on most personally in bdsa um we have communal effort we have creative or imaginative collaboration it's always like well why doesn't dsa have this thing it's like well make it make it you do it you do it now you do it now and uh i already you know dsa is one of the reasons that i can sleep at night to be honest it really is um so these are basically just these are the as far as i the way that i see it or as bernie would say in my view um these are the critical aspects of what we need in the future um some people would maybe call that aspect of mutual care comradeliness uh love i would be happy to and i often do but I think for some people, that's still a little bit too, like, touchy-feely of a word. Like, we don't really know, we don't have a great grasp uh, in, in the West, anyway, about what love is. And even speaking as somebody who I, I personally feel like I do know what it is and what it isn't, I think I didn't really feel, I didn't really feel that way until very recently, you know, like, just a few years ago. Um, I think I didn't really understand prior to that because I was not given the proper education by my family, my culture, or anything, um, that you can love somebody. You can say, like, I love you, and that doesn't have to mean, like, I want to have sex with you, I want to marry you. It doesn't have to mean that. That's something else, you know? That's, uh, you know, romantic love or um, sexual attraction or whatever. And this more general kind of love, this more comradely love, is the one that we have for each other. It's familial you know it's like we're all siblings um obviously scott and will you are literally siblings but you guys have that extra (laughs) extra layer of of being comrades as well so i think that's pretty cool um sorry bro (laughs) and yeah i mean that's what helps me sleep at night um it's not it's it's also my experiences at burns burns are pretty great uh or they have the potential to be i should say they also have the potential to be awful but they mostly are pretty great. And DSA is mostly pretty great. Again, we've also we've also had problems in DSA. We've had drama in DSA. Um, which seems to mostly be because we're not we don't really know how to be comrades sometimes, because we're not really taught how to be comrades. So you gotta learn that somewhere and you might as well learn that from your comrades. You might as well learn that here in DSA or, or whatever. Uh or, you know, do a spiritual practice, do something like that. Ask yourself, what is love? What does it mean to me? What does comradeliness mean to me? And then go out and find something that helps you figure that out. You know, and that could be, that could be taking acid, whatever. Whatever works for you, that's the main thing. I will never 
you can't really, there's nothing to preach there. There's no specific path that I can recommend it. It has to be something that works for you. So just like follow your gut, follow your gut. Um, Ramdas would say, follow your heart. I think again, that's just a little touchy feely for some people, <laughs> but it's kind of the same thing. Um, you already, you already know what will work for you deep, deep in yourself, and you just have to uncover that. Anyway, yeah, I wrote that I don't know exactly how to save the world. I don't know exactly what uh, an acid communist future would look like, but I do know these things so far, and I know that it starts from the ground up. And the best part is I really, I already see it. I'm already seeing it in these places that I've talked about. It's already starting. It's already starting, guys. So, like, how do we... How do we, how do we fluff it up? <laughs> That's the only, That's what came to mind. How do we mind. fluff it up? How do we fluff it up? How do, how do we keep this movement hard, guys? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that is what fluffing means. Shut up. Yep. <laughs> wow. Hey guys, that was quick. We, I, could, I could take that even further, but I'm not going to. I think I know. What you mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, that's a good question. How do we continue this moment? How do we bring about a more transcendental, more uh, you know, because acid communism is more of an experience. How do we bring about that experience more in our our you know collective in within our circles, in our comrades, and hopefully within the rest of our society because we live in a society society. society. right i didn't mention a mutual aid groups mutual aid groups are a pretty great place to start as well so if you as we always say on the epoch if you have a mutual aid group near you consider volunteering or otherwise supporting it do you know any of uh you folks have uh, an answer to the question will or joe of what we think, what you think you could po- we could possibly do, or anything, any other more ideas, anything else you want to elaborate on? My immediate reaction of what, how to take that and kind of um, twist it in an acid communism way, because the, my big takeaway from the acid communism idea is that you need a new perspective on the way these things can happen. And these things like Burning Man and these groups, these organizations, mutually, whatever, is it in action? which is so often hidden and just the sheer fact that people are doing it they're engaged they're they're showing that it can be done and you like you were saying how big burning man has gotten is a testament to the power of these types of beliefs exactly yeah so i think just the fact that you have that and at a scale of that where you have you know almost 100,000 people showing up in the middle of a desert building a city and tearing it down just because they can um I might be over exaggerating. I forget the number, but I know it's massive now. It, it, it people see it's possible, and that a better world can be built. Better things are possible. Yes. Yes, they are. You hear that, you fucking liberals? It's, I'm it's sorry. Such a, <laughs> it's such a cop out because it really is like, well, just do it. Like it seems like such a such a, or like just just show it can be done. Seems like such a quick, easy answer. It's obviously so much harder said than done. Um, but that's a great point that like. The Marys with some, like you said, like DSA can just go ahead and do a thing. I know, I think you were probably do the thing. working groups and stuff like that, but you have a collective of people that are single-minded enough that could make something happen on, maybe not quite that scale necessarily yet, but to whatever end, show what is possible with like minds. Join DSA, Joseph. y'all. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, join <laughs> yeah. DSA. <laughs> Because what else are you doing? What else are you doing? Nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to show up to fucking meetings. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's not mandatory. I wonder how much of this. I when I think of kind of like what a future like this looks like, I you have to envision. I can't help but envision things that have existed in the past, which is part of a blind spot. But I'm glad the mechanic quote. Well, that's had the earlier. point. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad the mechanic quote that uh, Shava had earlier. Forgive me if I forget. Um, brought up aboriginals and stuff like that too because I can't keep help at least being 
in America and being in Massachusetts, South Shore, which is, you know, and just having Thanksgiving two weeks ago, whatever it was, I can't help but think of like, well, how was that? Like a more Native American collectivist type of society and stuff like that. With people that are so in touch with all the spirituality and stuff, or peoples that have been so in touch with the spirituality, I, I, that has to have some sort of connection. I, I don't think it's, a, I, I, it's, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the right way to put this and be sensitive enough to it. But that's an ideal type of collectivist living. That's right. Um, this is, yeah, honestly, I didn't really think about it, but that's something we should definitely mention. Um, Native peoples uh, all over the world, including Native peoples in the U.S., despite the fact that the capitalist, uh, industrialist, white uh, juggernaut has completely trampled upon their way of life, their ways of life, I should say, uh, those traditions are still alive, if only, sometimes if only in wisdom and folklore that are carried and preserved by those peoples. And a lot, there actually are a lot of folks, there are a lot of Native folks who are making it their mission to try and um, disseminate those ideas and those principles in the modern world. I actually met um, this really amazing woman named Grandmother Patricia I think it was last year I met her in uh, New York City because my partner's uh, mother lives there and she is very plugged into a lot of um, sort of new agey. I, I hesitate to say new agey, but you know what I mean. Like folks it's, and people. It's appropriate, but it comes with a connotation, right? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. yeah. yeah and that's what I was going to say about uh, the school that you went to, like maybe that's why it was also private Joe is that it was new agey and it's hard to get funding for that. <laughs> it actually very much was not, which is kind of surprising to me. Like if it, there was nothing, we were never, uh, there was no, okay. So to be fair, to be fair, it started as an Episcopalian school, but, um, as I was just that starting makes more sense. Yeah, as I was starting to go there as well, it was kind of moving away from that and towards a more, you know, even even more secular and kind of like I was one of the last um, students to be required to take a Bible class um, when I was in ninth grade. I think the next year they switched to a class called World Religions, which, you know, yeah, that's a little more appropriate for the modern era. I remember ninth grade Bible class. Yeah. Yeah, we had that Cronin. Really? Did you guys go to like Catholic school or something or no, no public school? <laughs> really? They would you take Bible at a public school? Yep. I fought back a One little semester. bit. She was like, it's allegorical. You need to know it for all the references and stuff. And I guess to be fair, looking back, it didn't try to push a theology or faith. It was just more read the stories. So you, it was know. basically just the, uh, what is the first book of the Bible called? Genesis. Genesis. Yeah. It was basically just Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean i remember stuck. yeah uh, i remember it being uh i don't know i mean it was taught at that time i don't know it was it was like i had a hard time getting anything out of it but that may have been because um i wasn't raised in any kind of tradition we were always we were always encouraged to to find our own find things that were capital t truth to us um, it, I don't, you know, I didn't have a dogmatic experience of any kind, really. I mean, <laughs> I think when I was a freshman, we had Eucharists every month, but that was always a big part of that was like a speaker would come and talk about something. And I remember like, you know, the rabbi from the local temple came and he, he was really cool and they never really tried to shove anything down our throats. I think that when, when, when I was still like in ninth grade or whatever, and we were still doing occasional you know, Episcopalian things, volu and, uh, not voluntarily, involuntarily. <laughs> it, it felt more just like, here's, you know, here's a place for you to do this if you want, because a lot of my classmates were raised in Protestant traditions, and they would take communion or whatever. Um, it really was not a new agey place. It was, because that's the thing, I mean, I think the, the downfall and the, and the, uh, 
weak spots and the 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 vulnerable and less effective parts of what you could call new agey stuff is that it starts to get preachy and i think that's actually a really important thing to think about because like i was saying earlier if you're going to have you know you really have to find your own path you really have to be eclectic and you have to get in touch with yourself and ask yourself what is meaningful for you and you can get very far like you would be surprised you can completely transform yourself you can really like distill yourself into a, a very powerful <laughs> um and i don't want to say effective person but you know i mean you can like do a lot like if you can find your own uh i don't want to say beat of your own drum because that's an overused um metaphor but You really got to figure out what is truth for you and just take that into yourself and start building it up on itself. I mean, you could say you could go your own way so I can drop in like a little bit of clip from the Fleetwood Mac song. You you could do that. You could go your own way. Uh, You can. You can do that. You can call it another lonely day. You can absolutely. That's you should go your own way. And, you know, what What it is is that if you go your own way, I think, just keep, you, you go that way and you go and you go until you find yourself in the garden. That's what it is. You go until you find yourself surrounded by other people who are also there. And that's where it is. It's you guys all together. You know? You know? Well, yeah, uh, like we said at the beginning of the episode, I'm Scott. Uh, I am on the internet at Death Mullet on Instagram and Twitter, but I'm also on SoundCloud at Sweaty Wife or at SoundCloud.com slash Sweaty. This fucking look of Sweaty Wife. It's good music. Uh, good music, yeah. y'all. You've probably heard some of it during this episode, during some transitions and such. Hava, you should go next. Because you are basically the co-host of this episode. It's true. I'm I'm Chava. Um, <laughs> I'm here on this podcast sometimes. Not that yeah. often. <laughs> it's pretty rare. I don't know. I mean, I usually let Ellie. It's mostly Ellie's thing. Ellie's the one who prefers to. I don't know. I shouldn't say that. I mean, like, obviously, we've had a great time tonight, and uh, this is. This shit is, this is the stuff that, like, animates me in life in general. Um, you said it might even get you interested in theory. Yeah. I mean, it's not like I've never read any theory. <laughs> Especially, like, in college. Well, yeah, taking it more seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, I read Zizek in, in, high, in college. I read uh, Walter Benjamin. Um, it's just, like, this is the stuff... I feel like a lot of theory, a lot of communist theory is so, it's just like stuff that I already know, you know? Like, I feel like this stuff that we've talked about tonight is, it's in the same spirit as a lot of communist theory. I'm not like, I'm not saying like, I'm never going to read any theory. I don't want to do it. But this is, I don't know, like acid communism, the whole like imagining the future stuff, it's, it's a lot more, um, it gets it provocative. It gets the people going. It gets me going. Anyway, Will. Yeah, get those juices flowing, Will. You want to go next? Uh, I'm Will. I'm on here once in a blue moon. I'm not really on the internet. I mean, I am. I lurk. I have nothing to contribute. Uh, he <laughs> means that on the internet. And I frankly can't. And I frankly can't remember my Twitter name because it's just like initials. Another man with his name on Twitter being initials is Joe. Go. It is. Uh, Joe. I am not reading it this time. Uh, yeah, that's about it. 
Someone says Twitter. If you want to find Joe, <laughs> you can find him in uh, the meadow of the future, being abducted by <laughs> aliens. Uh, on top of a corpse of on top of yeah, a, yeah. he gets abducted <laughs> on top of a pile of oh, dead people, dead old people in this field, <laughs> in this meadow. Wait, I'm I am at the bottom of a pile of old people. You're now? at the top of a pile of dead bodies of old people that you've killed for their old adrenochrome. <laughs> and then the aliens come down and start abducting you, and then they see what you've done and your attitude, and they're like, I don't know about this. <laughs> We're the epoch of incredulity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.